Awesome. Uh, welcome uh, to, to this talk on uh, the last uh, 12 months of Bosch, which has been pretty exciting. Um, I do have a question to ask, which is, uh, you know, you look at the, the events page of Cloud Foundry, you know, all the, the, the summits and the days everywhere, and as you scroll through this very short page, you're left with, with you know, sort of the question, which is, um, where, where is my Bosch event? I, I you know, poor, poor Wally. <laughs> He's um, like, we're, Bosch has been out six years and what, my car still can't get its own day? Like we had it once, but that was even a side thing. I'm pretty sure there are enough people in the world who desperately just want to spend some time understanding Bosch better. Um, in lieu of that, and then we don't even have a track. There's no Bosch track. So I get 25 minutes to tell you everything the Bosch team has been working on and the wider community for the last 12 or so months. And... Um, uh, but I can't start yet because I have to tell you about the fire exit. Um, <laughs> the city of Boston thinks it's more important than I tell you about what to do if, if a window goes open and the air pressure sucks one of us out. Um, I'm not sure if that's how buildings work, but that's in the news right now. And, uh, and I want you to make sure you, you grab that person before they go, and go out the window. That's, then you get to go in the news. I don't think that's in the fire exit announcement, but hopefully by now you've read it. Um, and if you are currently making a fire, please just wait till I finish talking and then get back. So I've broken up uh, the review of what's, but the, the Bosch team. So I, I, I do, I'm not on the Bosch team. That sounds a lot of fun. Um, I just get private messages from Dimitri saying, hey, have you tried this feature out? I'm like, no, Dimitri, I didn't know it existed. Um, and, and then I, I, I get to be excited by them. Some of them I don't play with straight away and to my own detriment. And uh, I should just do what Dimitri tells me to. So, um, but it does make me very happy to be, uh, get the opportunity to share what, what the teams have been working on and, and I guess the wider community. So, the, um, what is there? Oh, the, I guess first there was the new logo in the last 12 months, which is changing all our lives radically. And, um, but you know, all my old swag goes, we, we don't even have swag. Dimitri, <laughs> come on, dude. Where's my t-shirts, where's my conference, where's my... But we have a logo. Um, all right, one thing we do have, just the other day, is they shipped a, a, a refresh of the site. It looks fantastic. Um, and I guess my favorite feature is the inline search. So you don't have to play around with Google queries where you used to have to type the thing you want to query and do site colon Bosch IO, <laughs> and then Google would find it for you. Uh, now there is search. Um, uh, there was also uh, a book I wrote, which is new in the last 12 months. Uh, people who've read it have said thanks. Well, I hope perhaps it's useful. Uh, the story it tells is a story of you as someone who, against your will, has been told to learn Bosch. <laughs> I felt that that was a real thing right now. Uh, <laughs> And I, it, it, it means I don't, we don't have to start with let's boot up Bosch, which is like a minefield of like everything hard about Bosch is just getting it running to start with, or your credentials, the networking. At the time, that's the highest. At the same time, your interest is lowest. So let's, let's you know, start somewhere else. So it starts with, it assumes you've been put in front of, of, of an environment, and let's look at how it works, and then we'll come back out. And by the end, you're super excited. Guaranteed, absolute promise, uh, or your money back. Um, there's a video I put out, which is, you know, I don't think there's a lot of content, so there's that, I'm just sharing. Um, I, do, I was made to remember, uh, Hammer put out a video series on Bosch, which I don't have a link to, but there is a, a course you can buy. All right, so on to the CLI. Um, please make sure that your version number is not one. <laughs> All right, if anything else I talk about is not working, it's because you skipped this slide. Um, Obviously, uh, you want to run that command. Uh, I don't think definitely technically works as an answer, but you know, um, it should. So one of the things, so I, 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 whilst I know many of the, I did ask a lot of my friends and, and uh, Bosch people, uh, people I know use Bosch, um, what their favorite things were. And there's a blog post going with this where I attribute each of these to different people. Um, but certainly a range of people all said that these environment variables are one of their favorite new things, the ability to you know, just you know, source a file that says this is what I'm doing, or a shell script, or Bubble uses this, Buck, Buck uses this, to, uh, to target environments. So the first four are targeting an environment. Um, the new move towards having good certificates. Um, I, for one, 
was a generous cargo culture of certificates across Bosch files that I didn't know what they did or how they worked. And they didn't work because they were just from 2012 or something. Um, so one of the things we have, and we'll get onto variables, but with the new certificates, you know, it's more and more CLIs, including the Bosch CLI, are respecting a root CA and, um, and making sure that that works. Uh, instead of using the minus D flag, we've got the Bosch deployment environment variable. And, um, and the, the last one is super useful if your Bosch is like a Bosch Lite. And, you, and, and I, I'm talking about Bosch Lite running on another infrastructure. So you don't have direct access to containers. This allows you to sort of SSH into any of those VMs or containers through the Bosch. Um, and, uh, and certain tools will just do all this for you. Um, here's an environment example. Hopefully none of you put your Bosch on the public internet. Let's not do what everyone does with Vault. Um, <laughs> There's like, you, know, you can search through all the Let's Encrypt registries for, and, and by Vault, and it's like, look at them all. Everyone's just putting Vault on the internet. Um, Bosch has lots of ports it listens in, and just don't. Please put it on a private network, which leads to the question of a great Nick, so how do I get to it? Um, you might have the EPNs, but it's becoming a lot easier to have a jump box. Um, and so you have the Bosch all proxy environment variable, which uh, you can run a, a SSH session locally, and then, then uh, in all the environments, all the shell scripts, sorry, all the terminals where you want to talk to Bosch, you just set the uh, Bosch or proxy to that port. And all your requests will go through the jump box. Um, I put the CredHub one in there too, because to use Bosch, sometimes you need to use CredHub to reset credentials and have them regenerated or to fetch API keys. Um, and, and that's the uh, proxy for uh, the CredHub CLI. So, Hopefully, you've used the Bosch deployment repo, but certainly at this time last year, it was one of the, the, the most exciting things to come into my life. Um, and, uh, and with it is the Bosch create env command. So um, just to quickly walk through this command, um, you might have copied and pasted it a few times and not really known why it was doing and why it was doing it. So one of the core ideas right, right up front is the idea of a base manifest that does as much as possible to work. The Bosch one is struggles because it does need a CPI and things. But you know, it, it's got nearly everything in it that you need to, to deploy a Bosch VM. Um, you do need something that talks about what CPI, so we have operator files, and I am going to talk about operator files shortly. The next line is the state and the var store. Um, if you're ever wondering, what is really my Bosch? What describes my Bosch? Like, what, what is the thing I should protect with all my life? And it's, it's that state.json. That is the little database on your laptop that says what is your Bosch. And the most important part of it, and it's not in my slides, is the reference to the disk. You can get rid of everything else in that file, but as long as you know what your disk ID is, you can rebuild your Bosch. Um, and so if you have not yet moved to Bosch deployment, and you've been using Bosch init or something else, as long as you've got that state.json, you've got that disk reference, is, is the simplest thing in the world to move to upgrading and deploying using a new system, because all you need is that state file. Um, the VAS store we're going to talk about when we talk about explicit uh, variables and generating credentials. Um, they get uh, stored locally. And then minus O, these operator files. Little, little changes. And you can see now, it is as easy to deploy a Bosch without the UAA as it is to deploy it with the UAA. It's as easy to deploy a Bosch without CredHub as it is to deploy it with CredHub. As such, we will always assume that you have, I, I assume you've got the UAA and CredHub and all Bosches. Um, I think most of the Bosch releases I work on slowly deprecating a reference to not having CredHub because it's verbose and, uh, and it's just so easy to have. You know, I'd say CredHub is stable and working. I, okay, it will fill up its disk. Uh, and hopefully they fix that problem. Uh, it has an audit table that it's very enthusiastic about putting entries into. Uh, and because of an audit table, you can't delete things from audit table, that's irresponsible. Um, <laughs> so it just grows and grows, especially if you put uh, concourse on top of it. Um, so keep an eye out for that. But Bosch is a little better behaved. Um, and adding a dump box user. You may have discovered in the last 12 months that you stopped being able to easily SSH into VMs. Um, the solution to that is to generate a, uh, an explicit user called jump box with a private key that you have locally, and now you can SSH or do the gateway. Great, you want a jump box. Uh, probably one of the most unloved parts of everyone's infrastructure 
is that Bastion VM they just sort of spun up with Terraform? How old's that VM? I don't know. <laughs> is it backed up? Is it got a disk on it? Oh, no one knows what it even is. Um, and so it is as easy, so you might not have ever thought about it, but Bosch Create Env can deploy anything. One, of, one variation of anything is nothing. And nothing is what we call a jump box. Now, okay, it's not quite nothing, we'll put some users and whatever, but I mean, plus or minus, what this is doing is pretty much booting up a blank VM. Put a persistent disk on it if you like, put, you know, user, you got your jump box user, could be on that. Um, um, but now we have the full ability of, of Bosch Create Env to update the base stem cell. Uh, if there are any other things you want to apply to it, then we can always use Bosch. We have ownership of that VM in a fashion that perhaps you've never really had before with your Terraform fissioned sort of VM. With those two things in mind, the Bubble team or the, the Bosch Bootstrap team have uh, taken upon themselves to, um, to make this even easier. Then they not just managing the Jumpbox and Bosch, but also they provide a Terraform plan for all the different environments they support. So if you've got nothing and you've been wondering how to get started, the Bubble project is uh, a really you know, valuable place to start. Um, and whether or not you want to keep using the way they do Jumpbox, the way they do Bosch, that's not the point. You've got started and you, know, you can start showing success, you can start getting uh, Cloud Foundry, whatever else running. Uh, I don't, you know, the way I deploy Bosch is with a tool called Buck, and this time next year it might be with something else, but I like this. Because what's the next thing you should probably deploy after to Bosch? Whatever pipeline system you're going to use to deploy everything else. If it's not on the same VM, that means you have to Bosch deploy it, which means you just deployed it without using a pipeline and it becomes a risk, you know. Um, so, the, you know, the idea of sticking concourse straight on the same VM means that it's up and you can start using it to deploy everything else. Um, I actually started using Buck in production, not because of Bosch, I wanted Concourse. And so I, I actually was running it just because I needed a new Concourse in production. And then uh, I fell in love with it, and so now I use it for, uh, for everything. Has Buck, Buck up is a virtual box light. CPI AWS is uh, obviously pick an AWS, and light just means it will be on that CPI, but it will be a, a warden CPI. Another thing that's uh, new is multi CPI, which kind of two different major use cases. One is uh, using the same CPI like the OpenStack CPI, but allowing you to have talking to different OpenStack installations from the one Bosch. It's like a, a multi-region, so a multi-AZ sort of support. I believe that was one of the reasons uh, like Swisscom, whoever added this, or Swisscom. Um, the other one I heard a few years ago, and I have not yet tried this out, but I think Dimitri and I have amused over this might so someone will give us some Complaint, you hear some kind of complaint about this takes too long, errands take too long, compilation takes too long. It's like, wouldn't it be cool if we just had the Warden CPI on every Bosch? And then compilation jobs could just run inside that. Errands could run inside that. Um, I still think it's cool. Um, so hopefully Dimitri makes that easy. One of us should just at least try it first. Um, and the, the sort of the next main thing um, that, uh, uh, of, of running environments that's, that's valuable is, is DNS. Um, way back in the day, we had DNS. Um, so the, every, the way it worked is a bit like what's, what's up on the top. Uh, some suffix, dot bosh, it's all internal to your environment, so it's, it's your own root. And then it's sort of reading from right to left is the deployment name, the network name, the job name, or the instance group name, and, and the index. Um, and that allowed you to sort of reference things across your cluster without having static IPs and having any like that. The downside of the original implementation was it was written with Power DNS, which was running on your Bosch. So if you're ever upgrading your Bosch, or if your Bosch was down, nothing could talk to anything, which is not the best implementation of DNS. Um, so it was both a solution and a terrible anti-pattern. Um, and fortunately, uh, the team uh, went about a different solution. And at, at its core, is basically caching the DNS entries locally on every machine. So it's all done, and there's no central point of failure. Um, it supports aliasing, so you'll start to see. So you get that same default. Every instance group gets its own known entry. But that's kind of ugly. And so your environment can specify DNS entries that mean something to you. 
Um, the best example, well, the one that's in the top of my head is the CFCR project is used as heavily to have nice DNS entries that are internal. Um, and I, I trust at some point this will be the default and it'll just be involved in, installed on in everything. Um, but it does mean you need to start thinking about addresses as not being IP addresses. Over time, there'll be more and more DNS entries rather than IP addresses, and then eventually you won't see IP addresses. You'll just be playing with DNS entries. The next topic is deployment manifests. Um, the original demo I was given this time last year to sort of bring to my mind what the big change had happened uh, in, the, in the thinking about things was deploying Cloud Foundry. Even this time last year, big, big effort had gone into this idea of what is CF deployment, which is now the only way to deploy Cloud Foundry. CF release is gone, CF deployment is it. But this is the canonical story that just should make you fall in love, and that is it's one base manifest and one variable. It's incredible. Like, there's no more mashing together of spiff files or spruce files or um, guessing. Like, you know, what makes this work is not just the new Bosch CLI, it's also cloud config and, uh, and runtime config. But, and, but there's this idea of systems you want to deploy having a base manifest that works. You don't have to mash three things together to get things working. There should be, there should be something that just works for everyone. And then operator files that tweak it to make changes. Um, you know, this one by default is going to have a, a, a blob store VM. You might not want that. You might want to use S3. Well, there's an operator file for changing it to S3 and getting rid of the blob store VM. So a base manifest that works with operator files to bring it to the environment that you want. Um, so what do variables look like inside your manifest? They're these uh, double parentheses uh, tokens. And... Uh, uh, and you'll get an error if you've missed one, so it doesn't just fail later. I love fast failure. I don't love failure 20 minutes from now. Um, so if you're missing a variable, it, the error might be obscure. Some might complain that it's not in config server or something like that, um, because we'll explain we are config server and create up in a second. But um, there are a number of ways to provide variables, and, uh, and, and you know, the minus V flag is, is one of them. So that's implicit variables. This is explicit variables. That's what the documentation calls them, Dimitri. I, that's not quite how I think of them, but this is the secret variables, and that's the other one, the external variables. So to me, to me that's an external variable. It's something I have to provide. It's, it's provided by me probably because it's something to do with the external world that only I know about. But what CF deployment has a lot of in it is internal variables that I don't care about. It was really bad because I cared so little that I just copied them from deployment to deployment. Um, the JWT token, no idea what it's for. Uh, I'm pretty sure I was using the same one from you know, 2013. Don't know what it does. Um, that's, why, that's why I don't get to stand in production environments because I'm <laughs> immature. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, it's a, a, this is what this is all about, right? It's, it's, it's much easier to do the right thing. You have to work hard to bust this and to start providing bad credentials. So there are literally 80 of these things in the current CF deployment, um, like 37 passwords, 41 certificates, an SSH and an RSA. Um, and uh, it just works. You don't have to figure, you know, as long as you, if you do change any DNS entries, you've got to regenerate some of them, and that's about the only thing you need to know. Um, you might need to know how to use CredHub to get them back out if you need to use them externally. But So uh, you'll find this section Obviously, it's very long. It's got 80 of them, but uh, in your CF deployment manifest or any Bosch deployment manifest, hopefully it's got this section. Um, so different types. Um, and uh, the list of types is somewhat dependent upon the backend config server. At the moment, there's kind of two, maybe, like there's CredHub, and then there's not using anything and just letting the CLI do it for you. But let's, I, I would like to assume you're using CredHub from now on until someone else makes one that's other different and, we can talk about it, but um, so the CredHub documentation lists all the different certificates. Um, but if you're just deploying stuff, you don't even need to care. Just it does it for you. If you ever want to rotate secrets, one option is to just delete them and deploy again, and it will make them again and pass them all to the places. That you, who cares? You don't care what the certificates are. Passwords keep rotating them, except encryption, encryption keeps. Don't. And change that one. 
Nothing good happens if you change the, like today's the encryption key, what? Like, because it's the last day you're employed here? What is, what is special about that? Don't, don't touch the encryption key. Um, okay, so I mentioned that there are different ways to set variables. Uh, the Bosch CLI, there's th three main commands that sort of pass, that have this idea. So obviously we've got create env and deploy. So Bosch create env creates that standalone VM, whether it's a jump box or a Bosch or whatever. Um, Bosch deploy is where we actually talk to a Bosch and ask it to do the work for us. The one at the top, Bosch Int, you've hopefully seen by now, it's where you can do the interpolation of the manifest just to see the outcome. It also has a path expression, so you can then interpolate and then pull things out. Um, it's like a little mini JQ built into it. Um, and if you don't know what JQ is, then you missed all of 2014. I think Alex Arachi said you know, JQ was like his tool of the year for 2014. Um, and no, I didn't just ask him, and he placed it in history. That I asked him in 2015, and I'm the one that remembered what year it was. Uh, he's not a fucking freak. Hey, he is a freak, but not in that way. Um, he's a good freak, not a crazy date-remembering freak. Um, sorry, Alex, if you're watching this. Um, you're also the author of Spiff, so I think it's always worth bringing that up, uh, that for anyone that used Spiff, it's his fault. And, um, so, different ways. Um, most of these are about reading variables, different ways. The bottom one is a read-write, and this is where if you provide this vast door, all those generate those uh, internal credentials, what the documentation refers to as explicit variables, they'll be generated into that file if they're not provided some other way. So when you do Bosch create env, you'll often see vast store equals creds.yaml. That's where they all are, sitting on your file system. Which apparently is not a great thing, but that's where they go. And I, I know that there's either a pull request or an issue discussing you know, the idea of, of them being somewhere else, but that's, that's kind of the story at the moment. Um, but for Bosch deploy, we have, we have this other idea, and that is the cred hub story. Um, now, um, I'm going to tell you quickly why we have these two phrases, config server and cred hub, because at the start of last year, uh, config server was the abstract idea of what might be implemented by something like cred hub. Um, cred hub was initially not a public open source project idea, it was going to be a private project, proprietary project, and so they needed an abstraction. In the end, they made it open source, and now we have to talk about the two things, but they are somewhat synonymous. You can implement different config servers. I think it's a pretty simple API. Um, so if you want to back by Vault, backed by something else, yeah, you can implement that. Um, but the main one you'll ever hear anyone talk about is Cred Hub, so we somewhat talk about them you know, um, as one. Um, and so you don't specify the variables. They'll just get generated and fetched from that. You can pass them still through. It, when you, you, know, you can pass minus V. But the generated ones can be generated in Cred Hub, and you can manually put them in a Cred Hub, and they'll be pulled back out. So you know, you go off and get your Amazon secrets. There, from Bosch's perspective, no, they're external, but they're secrets. So you can put them in a Cred Hub, and now no one else needs to know about them. Very exciting part, uh, and it was not exciting when I first saw it. I was quite mad about it, um, but then I matured and grew up and got used to it, and it's better. Um, because, so the, the operator files are a way of, of, of modifying YAML. So remember we told the story of, of that one base operating, uh, that one base manifest. Bosch deploy CF, Bosch deploy CFCR, Bosch deploy MySQL. A, a base manifest that works. Um, but you do need to probably make some changes. Like, you might want to change its name because there's already one with that name. Um, change the sizing, change the, the secrets or whatever. Um, and, um, and so uh, the Bosch CLI implements this notion of, of operator files, implemented by a library called GoPatch, and it's this idea of, of explicitly making changes. So instead of just mashing two YAML files together like we sort of did with Spiff and with Spruce, we uh, make strategic changes. So replace and remove uh, a path somewhere down a nested tree, and then insert, replace, whatever. You can search by tag, you know, labels, and that, uh, that, that uh, URL has a full explanation of, of, of everything. Uh, I had not seen the before and after column thing, so that was interesting to see. 
Um, and what I like about it is, and why I like it better than what I used to have, is that it fails fast. You, know, you, you, you start to build out your own set of changes to upstream. You know, you're deploying Cloud Foundry, you're deploying CFCR, you're deploying whatever, and, or Bosch, and uh, you assume you know what's coming, so you make your changes. Well, you want to know if they make changes to the assumptions. You want it to fail, so you go and check it. You don't want to just mash it together and deploy something. Um, and so that, that's what I liked about it, was, was the fast failure. For those of us writing releases, which hopefully everyone does, um, it's not just for deploying MySQL. Um, bespoke code is a perfectly valid place to, to you know, boshify something. Um, you know, given CI and everything, I mean, you can merge through and, and build out a nice pipeline, building bespoke Bosch releases and deploying them through a pipeline. Um, so it's a much smaller footprint of things to go wrong than putting things on top of Cloud Foundry. Um, given that you can create final releases, given that you can create compiled final releases, you can then put them in dark data centers, and you know, you've got a whole pu push pushing things to the edge story that uh, you don't really have with a big Cloud Foundry. Um, given that you all should be writing Bosch release, so at least how to do it, here's a couple of, of, of new things in the last 12 months. The, uh, and and I, there's no additional slides, so I'm just going to talk about each one. Um, Sorry, there are no specific slides for each one. The so Bosch Process Manager, or BPM, is an attempt um, to solve a couple of problems. One is, is the copying and pasting across all Bosch releases of, of shell scripts to manage processes. So we, uh, if you've never written a Bosch release, the way we start and stop processes is with Monit, which is nice in that it's not something that the Cloud Foundry team wrote. Sometimes we might accuse them of non-invented here syndrome. Well, they picked Monit, good on them. Now we don't know why they picked Monit, but they did. Um, and so every Bosch release needs to have a starting point, which is a Monit file. It can be blank, if you never knew that, it can be blank. Um, but it can specify one or more processes to run. And Monit will take over the responsibility of restarting it if it dies, or booting it up initially. So typically what we then do is we have this wrapper script and, and, and scripts, we call that to other scripts to manage processes, kill things, reap it, um, set up environments, environment variables, create folders, etc. because Monit starts with the very clean. And, um, and there's also no isolation between all our jobs. Now, in the world of containers, we've started to get used to things to be a little more you know, constrained in what access they have, especially when we start mashing together Bosch releases from different vendors. So Bosch Process Manager makes it uh, super nice and clean. To, it's like a small YAML file to say, run this process with these arguments and these environment variables, please. It's so much nicer than all this, this shell script. It was funny, when they first sort of talked about it six months ago, um, and they pointed out all the shell script, I realized I hadn't seen it for four and a half years. Like, it was there, but you just sort of look straight past it. It's like, you know, your children's clothes on the floor. It's like, yeah, probably, you know, you're, if you're a child, your clothes, um, you just walk past them constantly. It's like, didn't know it was there. Well, it's been there a week. Well, I didn't know that. I know it's at the front of my bedroom door. I didn't know it, though. I know it, but it's like, it's... Um, so, when he, the moment he pointed that out, it's like, I can't believe that we've just been living this way. So, BPM has been great. Um, and I've refactored most things. I think CF deployment has a, a opt file to turn that on. Some other projects are just moving straight to BPM. Um, Bosch vendor package. Uh, to make it sense in my head, I started just calling them language packs. So it's like if you bring bespoke code, and you want like Ruby project, you bring a Ruby project, you need, you need Ruby. I don't, we're not gonna do interactive. I'll just answer the questions for you. Um, I've thought about them in advance, so I'm the best qualified to answer them. Um, <laughs> But it is five points to me. Uh, it's my system, I score, and I give myself five points. Um, which means I'm winning, because none of you got any points. So, um, now we don't have like a build pack system, which might be nice, but what we do have uh, historically is just copying stuff from other releases. They're like, oh, you've got Ruby? Not the right version, but it'll do. In you come, and you just <laughs> sort of bring it in. Um, so vendor package is this idea of saying, well, let's be a little more formal about it. If you like the version of Ruby that's in that release, how about you just take the final release package that's done and just reuse that? Um, so you don't have the blob, you don't have the packaging script, you just have the artifact that's done. Now, it will be compiled, you'll still have to compile it, but um, 
you now can just keep refreshing. So whenever they get a new version, you can just run the command again and get the new version. So um, I guess the next thing was, instead of just saying, well, Ruby is all these places, was to have a nice catalog of them. So there's a, there's a GitHub organization called Bosch Packages. Bosch Package, single plural. And, um, and so Dimitri's been curating a sort of a minimal, uh, some releases that are just like focused. So there's one for Ruby, one for Go. Uh, the Java one uh, is perhaps my favorite because Java's quite a tedious thing to find and to get as a th standalone thing without, like I had a lot more children, but every time I went to download Java, I had to give one of my children to Oracle. <laughs> and, um, and the paperwork alone made that tedious. Um, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Obviously, the loss of my children was bad too. All right, that was. But we hadn't named them yet, so it didn't mean as much. So it all worked out. Um, <laughs> Jesus. So <laughs> it's like, how far? Right. If I just keep going, eventually we'll find the, the nucleus of the nonsense. And it'll be, um, when you're deploying Bosch releases, uh, you, you know you do Bosch create release, Bosch upload release, Bosch deploy, over and over and over again. Uh, fortunately, some people got really annoyed by that and made it simpler. So in your manifest, there is, uh, you can just say the version is called create instead of latest. Latest means it has to be uploaded already. Create means the Bosch CLI will do those three steps for you. It will create it from wherever you referenced it. And you can actually reference things that are not that release. You can say, over oh, somewhere else in my, fault, my, my machine is a release. I need you to create that one as well. Um, and uh, and then it will create it, upload it, and, and, and deploy that very specific version. That's, that's right. If I've also got, my, my concern was I always had to use rebase because I had CI pointing at the same machine I was deploying to locally. It, it, it still maintains the very specific version. Right, OK, cool. I had not seen an issue, but then I'd only been playing it for a week. Uh, Dimitri had told me about this, but I had my you know, little command that I ran. I was a fucking idiot, and he fixed it, and I, now he's right and I'm wrong. That is kind of the topic, the theme of the talk, is here are all the things I was wrong and he was right about. Um, but Bosch Gen, I'm right about that, and he is wrong. Um, so Does create uh, use minus minus force to accept until it's in the read? I think, it, yes, Does it takes dirty, there's no force, yeah. It assumes it's a dirty, dirty project. And, uh, what he's saying is uh, when you run Bosch create release, uh, it gets angry at you if there's any git ch commit changes that haven't been committed. And uh, so you then have to type minus minus force. So we've all been doing that for five years. And that's a little tedious. And so that all goes away. So no more minus minus force, no more rebase, just, um, just Bosch deploy. So Bosch gen is something I've been looking after for six years now. And that doesn't make it right. That's not a reason. Just because something's been old, right? I have a seven-year-old child. That doesn't make him right about anything, all right? Just because he's got good with the language skills, better than daddy, and he can talk his way around me, it doesn't make, like, you walk away going, how would I agree to that? Come back. Daddy's thought more about it. No, you can't get in the pool right now. It's time to go to school. Um, it's uh, a tool I've just evolved over time for what makes it fun and fast for me to build Bosch releases. It often makes it easy to write documentation for how to get started at things. Um, has some fun little, you know, little things for extracting and um, the, base, the base repo. So if you're making a new Bosch release, it creates a manifest that works. So it assumes the job is there, it assumes in that first Bosch release, even though it does nothing, you can build it and deploy it and iterate from there. Um, and the last thing I, I beg upon you, so if you're a release author, I beg upon you to ship final releases that are compiled. I don't understand anymore why you would make me want to watch your stuff compile. <laughs> well, is something good going to happen? Like there's an ASCII art that's going to stream down the screen. You're like what? What is? Um, so you've, you've already compiled it once. You can be the last person. <laughs> that's OK. So please uh, have a look at that. Um, and you just put it in your pipeline. So it just compiles it and ships it. And there's another blob. Um, I know Dimitri has some other ideas about how to make it more native. Um, and, and we'll see where that comes to and whether we get to talk about it this time next year. Finally, there's a couple ideas around backup and restore to make sure you're at least thinking about it. You don't have a production system if you don't know how to restore it after a disaster. You have a career-defining event. That's what you have, and you shouldn't. Like, 
There shouldn't be a disaster. It should just be, okay, that was annoying and I have an apology email to... Think, when you think about backup and restore, think about it, if you're at all thinking about it, from what is the apology letter I could write now? Like, am I writing a, an internal apology letter to my team saying I did a little muck up and it's all fixed, no one's affected, we're all good? Do I write it to our users apologizing? Or is it the letter that you have to give to the chairman of your public company that he's going to send out to the, you know, the New York Stock Exchange? Um, I know our share price was this. I believe it's now this number uh, because we don't have any data on our customers anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, think about the pain that you're... So back up and restore. A couple of options is the BBR project, um, which tries to make a nice holistic approach to, to back up and restore. Locking things, letting Bosch releases. Not a lot of Bosch releases, I think, have actually implemented. I don't think any of mine have implemented it. And if you don't mind, uh, my use of I don't think, like, I'll talk to myself about it later, but I just don't think I've done it. Um, but more and more Bosch releases are supporting BBR, and they probably, and mine should as well. Um, and that means that you can sort of just take a whole sort of snapshot and get a backup. And then there's a Stark and Wayne project called Shield, which uh, gives you sort of a GUI and a whole more granular expression of, of backing things up, not just Bosch things, but uh, also service instances. So there's a couple of ideas there. Um, and if there's one thing to take away, it's to ask your local congressperson to, um, to demand that we get more Bosch conferences. <laughs> All right, I know there's some other hot political topics in America right now, like why you keep killing your own citizens, but other than that, um, probably number two, uh, other than you know, universal health care. Okay, so number three uh, <laughs> would be, can we please have you know, more time for us to spend together? So thank you very much.